Thank you very much. It's uh, good to have so many people here. Um, so this is a, one of a series of talks um, on the chemistry of things. And uh, part of the goal of these talks, I'm, I'm going to wander around here. Um, part of the goal of these talks is for them to be uh, approachable to the general public. So folks that don't, maybe don't have a chemistry background. Um, and maybe on topics that would be of interest to folks who are not uh, hardcore chemists. And so that's uh, the context of this talk. And um, I want to say uh, right at the beginning, um, you know, I'm talking about the chemist's perspective on making the perfect cup of coffee. There is no such thing. Thank you. Drive safely. <laughs> uh, the, the, really, there isn't. I mean, uh, um, I'm going to spend this whole talk talking about components and strategies and, and pieces and, and uh, techniques to make a really good cup of coffee. Um, what goes into making a really good cup of coffee? How you transition from a really good cup of coffee to a perfect cup of coffee, uh, I'll address very briefly right at the end. And it's, um, it depends on you a lot. So here we go. So the purpose of the talk tonight, um, is really to, uh, to browbeat you into drinking the, the kind of coffee that I think you should be drinking. Um, that's, that's my plan. No, it's not my plan. That is not really what I'm after. Uh, in all seriousness, part of what I want to accomplish is to expand people's perspective of what coffee can be. I think, unfortunately, for a lot of people, coffee serves primarily as a vehicle for caffeine intake, um, and that's about it. And yet, coffee can be a lot more than just uh, a way of getting your daily caffeine fix. I mean, caffeine pills work too. Uh, so why would we drink coffee? There's a lot more to coffee than just the caffeine, although we will talk about the caffeine. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about coffee processing methods and how they affect flavor. Uh, for those folks who may not be familiar with how coffee is processed, how it's uh, produced, we'll talk about a couple of those methods and why those matter. Uh, we're also going to talk about the most important variables when you're brewing coffee. What is it that matters? What, what things affect the flavor of brewed coffee and how can we uh, manipulate those to get the flavors that we want to make a really good cup of coffee? Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I really want to accomplish is to give you maybe a, what for some of you might be a new way of thinking about brewing coffee, a new way of... of uh, of thinking about this and uh, the process and, and um, what matters. And ultimately, I'm hoping that when you leave tonight, you will be better equipped to brew the best cup of coffee that you can, that you like, whatever that is. And so you may walk away from the talk tonight uh, intent on continuing to drink Folgers and brew it in your you know, 30-year-old Mr. Coffee. And if that's the, the, coffee, the cup of coffee that you like, more power to you. Uh, I am not going to talk about espresso tonight. Um, espresso, for those folks that may not know, is a very highly concentrated version of coffee that's brewed under high pressure. Um, and most people in the U.S. don't drink straight espresso. Most people in the U.S. drink lattes and cappuccinos and es drinks that have espresso in it, but they don't drink straight espresso, which is a shame. But one of the reasons why pe most people don't drink straight espresso is because much of the straight espresso that's produced in the U.S. is awful. Uh, and so people don't want to drink it. There's a whole world of coffee brewing and espresso that produces tremendously flavorful, delicious espresso. But it's really hard to do. <laughs> Um, and everything we're going to talk about tonight, the principles we're going to talk about, apply to espresso. It's just that there's a bunch of other stuff that applies to espresso as well that we're not going to get into. So I'm really limiting this discussion to brewed coffee, okay? Just straight up, regular old brewed coffee. We're not going to deal with espresso. Um, and so uh, why is espresso sort of off limits? Why am I not going to deal with it? Well, first of all, it's, very, it's much more expensive to brew good espresso. The equipment uh, requirements are much higher. Um, for one thing, you are brewing the coffee in a very short period of time under very high pressure, and so all of the details matter. 
all of the little tiny details that nobody really wants to think about or care about matter in producing espresso. And so I would sort of compare brewed coffee and espresso as sort of the difference between a Ford and a Ferrari. Right? They're both cars. Uh, brewed coffee and espresso are both coffee, and yet one of them has much higher tolerances than the other. Uh, and espresso has much higher tolerances, much less room for error than brewed coffee. Um, and so we're not, not dealing with espresso in this talk. Um, but we are going to talk about brewed coffee, and so I think it's useful for us to maybe all come to some sort of agreement about what we mean by coffee. What do we mean by that word, coffee? Um, and so from a technical perspective, I'm not going to get real technical tonight, but from a technical perspective, coffee is the result of extracting soluble compounds from a solid using a liquid solvent typically at elevated temperature. That's sort of chemistry speak for what you do when you brew coffee. You extract soluble compounds from a solid using a liquid solvent, typically at elevated temperature. And of course, we know water is the liquid solvent when we're brewing coffee. Fortunately, we don't drink many other liquid solvents. Um, and the solid material is a powder made from seeds. That sounds very unromantic. This whole description of coffee sounds very unromantic. But nevertheless, that is the truth. We're taking a powder made from seeds, and we're using a liquid solvent at elevated temperature to extract soluble compounds out of it, and then we're going to drink it. Okay? That is coffee. That is the process of brewing coffee. And so when you brew coffee, you are engaging in a chemical process. You are doing something similar to what chemists do all the time. We extract things using solvents. Uh, we don't drink them, generally. Uh, but, but we do extract things using, using solvents all the time. And so the process of brewing coffee really is a chemical process. It's, it's a process that can be informed by how we understand chemical principles. And that's really um, what, what I'm hoping to communicate tonight. You also need to know that coffee is a mixture of hundreds of compounds. In your cup of coffee, there are hundreds of different compounds in there. We are not going to talk about them all tonight, I promise. We're not even going to talk about very many of them tonight. Okay? We're going to talk in very general terms. We're going to talk in categories of compounds and broad categories of compounds. And so if you were hoping tonight to come to a talk where you were going to see all kinds of, of uh, structures up there, you know, and get in the nitty-gritty of all these different compounds and how the structures are, that's not this talk. Okay? That might be a talk for another time. That is not the talk for tonight. Okay, we're going to keep it very approachable, very simple. We're going to talk about categories of compounds, and that's about as deep as we're going to go into it. However, there are hundreds of different compounds in a cup of coffee. And each, of the one, of, each one of those compounds interacts with our taste system and our olfactory system in a different way. Which means when we drink a cup of coffee, we're drinking hundreds of different compounds, and the flavors that we sense are the combination of the interaction of hundreds of compounds with our sensory systems. And all of that means that coffee is very complex. Coffee is an extraordinarily complex thing. Um, and so trying to figure out how do we, how do we simplify that? How do, we, how do we whittle it down to just the essentials for a talk like this is actually a real challenge. Um, how do we take all that stuff, that's all the details, and whittle it down to something that's approachable, but I've tried. So I, I mentioned earlier that the solid that we're going to be extracting with the solvent is a powder made from seeds, and indeed they are seeds. They are not beans. Coffee beans are not beans. Some of you may know that. Some of you may not. Uh, coffee beans are not actually beans at all. They are seeds, and in fact, a coffee bean is one half of the seed that is at the center of something called a coffee cherry which looks, in some ways, similar to a regular old cherry. It is a fruit. A coffee bean is the seed at the center of a piece of fruit, which means coffee can taste fruity, and that's totally okay, because it is the seed at the center of a fruit. There is nothing wrong with coffee that tastes naturally fruity. If you take coffee and you pour a bunch of fruit oils on it, that's a whole different thing, right? I'm talking about coffee that naturally tastes fruity because it is the seed of a fruit. A coffee cherry has several layers to it. 
The first, or the first one we'll talk about is the outer skin, which actually has a pretty bitter flavor oftentimes. Um, and then we have the flesh, which is sort of like the texture of a grape. Okay, it's quite sweet and similar to the texture of a grape. And then you have the honey layer, which is surrounding the, the seed. Um, and it's very sweet as well and kind of viscous, uh, so thick. Uh, and then we have the parchment layer. And depending on what type of coffee you drink, you may or may not be familiar with the parchment layer because sometimes there's a little bit of that left on the bean. It's sort of a very thin paper looking layer um, that surrounds the, the bean or the seed. By the way, I'm going to continue to call them coffee beans. We're just going to agree amongst ourselves that we understand that they're not actually beans. Okay, I'm just going to call them beans. Okay, and then you have the seed at the middle. So why do we care about any of that? We don't put the cherries in our coffee grinder, right? We put the seeds in our coffee grinder. And so why do we care about the cherry? Why do we care about the fruit? Why do we care about the, the, the flesh? Why do we care about the, the honey layer? Why do we care about any of that stuff? Don't we just care about the bean? And the answer is no. We don't just care about the bean if we want flavor. If we want flavor, the cherry matters too. So, I said that coffee consists of hundreds of different compounds, and the question is, where do those come from? Where do all of those hundreds of compounds come from that we end up with in our cup of coffee? And these compounds are largely products of chemical reactions that occur. When we take coffee beans and roast them, heat them up, cause them to change color, there's a, there are a variety of different chemical reactions that occur in that process. And the products of those reactants are very often the very flavor compounds that we're after. Okay? So most of the flavor compounds that we have in coffee um, are products of chemical reactions that occur during roasting. If you have products of a reaction, chemists, that means we have to have reactants. right? You can't have products without reactants. So there's got to be things reacting in order to produce the products. So where do the reactants come from? to produce these flavorful products that we're after, that we get when we roast coffee. Where do the reactants come from? Some of them are already in the bean. Okay? Some of them start out in the bean, they stay in the bean, they're already there. But some of those reactants come from the coffee cherry. Some of those reactants that end up producing products, that, uh, the flavor compounds that we want in our cup of coffee, some of those come from the cherry itself. Now, at some point, the seed has to be removed from the cherry, right? We don't, we don't take the whole cherry and put it in the coffee grinder. So at some point, we've got to separate the two, okay? And there are a variety of ways that coffee producers do that. We call these different processing methods, and there are a ton of them. We are not going to deal with all of them. But the goal of any of the processing methods is to produce coffee beans that are packed with the reactants that we want, so that when we roast them, we get the products that we want. Okay? We can't get the flavorful products that we want in our cup of coffee unless the reactants are in the bean to start with before it goes in the roaster. So the purpose of, pro of coffee processing is to make sure that those beans have the reactants in them to end up producing the products that we're after in our cup. Okay, as I said, a bunch of different processing methods, lots of different variables, lots of different variations. We're going to talk about three very broad categories of processing methods, and that's it. Okay? So very, very broad categories. There's lots of different subcategories within these. So the first one we're going to talk about is a washed process. That's the one on the left over there. Uh, this is sort of a traditional or what has begun, become sort of a traditional uh, processing method. Um, the fruit is removed basically from the bean as soon as it's picked, essentially. We pick the fruit and immediately the, the fruit is washed off of the bean, so the bean is separated from the fruit right away. The downside to, wa to the wash process is that it is incredibly water intensive. Uh, it can take on the order of 40 gallons of water to produce one pound of coffee beans. It's a very, very water intensive process, so in some parts of the world, that can be a, uh, a real problem to produce wash process uh, coffee. Uh, there's very little fermentation period in wash process. Um, the consistency is going to be very high. So um, because there are very few variables that people are playing with, um, every bag is going to be pretty much the same. 
Um, the flavors of wash process are going to tend to be very clean. There's not going to be a lot of heaviness to those flavors. They're going to be subtle flavors. They're not going to be really overpowering flavors, generally speaking. Uh, and then on the far right, that's sort of the opposite process in some ways. That's the natural process. That's actually the ancient process. So those of you that don't know, coffee originated in Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopians were the first people to, to grow coffee as a crop um, and to begin consuming uh, coffee in any sort of significant quantity. And the natural process is the process that they used, where they actually picked the coffee cherry and then they set them out on beds in the sun and they let them dry in the sun for what can be a long period of time. And during that process, there's a fermentation process and essentially a rotting of the fruit that happens. And during that fermentation, I know it doesn't sound very good, uh, <laughs> but during that process, during that fermentation process, the, the fruit that's surrounding the bean is actually just packing it with all kinds of reactants. Okay, there's all kinds of good reactants going into that bean during that fermentation process. And then when you go to take the fruit off to separate it, it takes much less water to do that. Okay, so the wash process, getting the fruit off at the very beginning is very water intensive. Getting the fruit off after it's been fermented is much, much easier, much less water involved. Um, fermentation can be very long, can be weeks uh, that, the, that they're laying out there in the sun. They're being turned every day, these coffee cherries, to dry in the sun and ferment. Um, typical flavor sort of profiles from natural process coffees are going to be very heavy, very fruity, very jam sort of flavors. So a, a natural processed uh, Ethiopian coffee especially, it is not at all uncommon to open up the bag and feel like you, it, sm it smells like you just opened a bag of blueberries. It is just an overwhelming aroma of blueberries coming from those, those beans. And those are natural flavors. Those are flavors that ended up on the beans and in the beans because of the fruit. It, it sat at the center of that fruit for weeks fermenting and it's just packing flavors into that, into that bean. And then in between the honey process, so um, just real quickly, that's basically part of the fruit is stripped off. So the outer part is stripped off. The honey layer, that layer that surrounds the bean, that sort of thick, viscous, sweet layer is left on. There are a, a bunch of different subcategories of honey processing that we're not going to go into. Um, that tends to produce also a bit of a sweet or a, a fruity flavor, but mostly sweet. You get a lot, of, a lot of sweetness from honey processing. All of that to say, the fruit matters. The fact that this is the seed at the center of a piece of fruit matters if you want all of these crazy flavors that coffee can offer. Some of you may not have ever been exposed to those flavors. You may have never had a cup of coffee that tastes like lavender or blueberries or pineapple or green apple. All of those are possible flavors of coffee. So why don't we taste those more often? Well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll talk about that. So if you want good coffee, which beans do you go out and buy? Well, in order for you to extract good flavor compounds out of the beans, the flavor compounds need to be in the beans to start with, right? If you buy beans that don't have good flavor compounds, you're not going to get any out. So you need to buy beans that have good flavor compounds in them to begin with. The problem is that most of those compounds, most of those really tasty flavor compounds in coffee beans are gone within three to four weeks. If it's in whole bean form, if it's kept in as a whole bean, those, flavor, those tasty flavor compounds are gone within about three to four weeks. You can't ever get them back. They're gone. And that time scale for optimum flavor changes dramatically if you grind the coffee. If you grind the coffee, those flavor compounds are gone within a matter of a few days. They're just gone. And so most of the reason why we rarely taste these crazy flavors that coffee is capable of producing is because by the time we get the coffee, those flavors are already gone. It's old enough that those flavors have disappeared, especially if we're buying pre-ground coffee, because that, those flavors are gone probably before it ever left the factory or the, the production site. This process of those flavors going away is sometimes called staling, coffee staling, or we say that the coffee is going stale, and it's an oxidation process. Okay? It's, it's, these flavor compounds are being oxidized through exposure to oxygen, and there's not a ton that you can do about that. 
I mean, you can try to, to sort of flood the coffee beans with nitrogen or with argon or something like that to push all the oxygen out. But the reality is that the beans themselves have oxygen in them. And so there's really very little that you can do to prevent this staling process. You can slow it down a little by packaging the coffee well, but you can't get rid of it. It's going to happen. Those flavors are going to oxidize and they're going to go away. Or they're gonna, more specifically, they're going to turn into something a lot less tasty. The process of coffee going stale produces bad flavors. You're taking really good tasting compounds and you're turning them into things that taste really bad. The reaction with oxygen, that oxidation process, goes from really tasty to really bad and there's very little that you can do about it. Stale coffee is fine. I mean, you can, you can, you can drink coffee that's two years old. It's not going to hurt you. It's just going to taste awful. And nobody wants that, right? So stale coffee is not dangerous. It's just really, really unpleasant. So the take-home message. You're going to see throughout this talk, take-home messages, okay? These are, these are the things that I want you to take home with you, and I mean that literally. I have a whole sheet where these take-home messages are... I'm going to hand these out, okay? <laughs> these are literally take-home messages, Okay? There's a variety of other things on that sheet that I'll talk about in a minute as well. Uh, so these are literally take-home messages. The first take-home message, the coffee that you buy at the grocery store or at Starbucks is already stale. By the time you buy it, it's already stale. It's go the flavors are gone. The really good stuff that you want, it's not there anymore. They've been oxidized away because the, the distribution process of getting the coffee from the roaster to the store takes long enough that those flavors are gone, especially if you're buying pre-ground coffee. Okay? If you want to have any hope of making a really good cup of coffee, you have to buy coffee beans. Okay? If you buy pre-ground coffee, those flavors were gone a long time ago, and it is well into getting stale at that point. So fresh roasted coffee is crucial to making the perfect cup of coffee. If you want to make a really good cup of coffee, you must buy fresh roasted coffee. And that means within, roasted within probably the last week. Which means, generally speaking, you need to buy it from somebody local, oftentimes. Or you need to mail order it from somebody that can send it to you immediately. They roast it, they put it in the mail, and it gets to you within a couple of days. Okay? That's the kind of coffee you need to buy if you really want to access those flavors. If you want to taste coffee that tastes like lavender, or tastes like blueberries or pineapple or whatever, you need to buy fresh roasted coffee. You should always buy coffee that has a roasted on date that tells you when it was roasted. Okay? Very often coffee producers will put the best buy date. And best is very subject to interpretation. Often those best buy dates are nine months removed from the roasting date. So that means if you buy it and it's just before the best buy date, that coffee has been sitting in that bag for nine months. It has lost the good flavors eons ago. Okay, You, ha you really have to buy coffee that has just been roasted within the last few days, the last week, depending on how fast you go through your coffee, in order to be able to access those flavors. Okay, so uh, sort of moving on a little more technical stuff. Extraction, coffee extraction. We said we're extracting soluble compounds from the solid using the liquid solvent. The extraction process is really important. In fact, the extra extraction is the most important concept for you to understand in order to make good coffee. Extraction is the most important concept for you to understand in order to make good coffee. So what is the definition of extraction? I'm defining it as the process of transferring those flavor compounds from the solid, in other words, the coffee grounds, to the solvent, in other words, the water. So it's the actual process of taking those, sol those soluble compounds, removing them from the grounds, and putting them in the water where we can drink them. Okay? That's what we mean by extraction. We're pulling those soluble compounds out of the bean and, putting, and transferring them into the water. We're calling that process extraction. How does that transfer happen? I mean, you, you're pouring water on your grounds, right? 
but how does that actual transfer process happen of getting those compounds out of the bean and into the water? First of all, the water that you're pouring into the grounds enters little tiny pores in the coffee particles. Most people probably have not looked at coffee grounds in a microscope, but if you did, you would discover that it's full of holes. Every little piece of coffee grounds is full of holes. In fact, if you look at an electron microscope image of a coffee bean, that's a cross section of a coffee bean, you can see, maybe, depending on where you're sitting in the room, they're very small, uh, you can see all the little pores, right? All those little dots right there, those are all little tiny pores. By the way, this is the parchment layer that we were talking about, that real thin layer right there. That's that thin papery coating on the, on the surface of the bean. So this bean still has some parchment on it. These are the pores. And water is going to go into those pores. If we zoom in a little bit on a piece of coffee grounds, you can see the pores. Okay? These pores open up during the roasting process. These are actually cells in the coffee bean. And when you roast them, those cell walls break down. Okay? And so now, water can get in there. When you pour water on your coffee grounds, water goes into those little pores. And it goes into those pores and dissolves little, the, the flavor molecules that are in the pores. So the flavor molecules that are in there dissolve into the water, and then the water comes back out and ends up in your cup. Okay, So the, most of that water comes back out of those pores and ends up in your cup, and you end up drinking it. So when we're talking about extraction, we're talking about water going into the pores, dissolving those soluble com flavor compounds, and then coming back out and ending up in your cup. That's how coffee flavor ends up in your cup. Now, I introduced extraction, but I introduce, in, need to introduce another term that is very often confused with extraction, and that is coffee strength. You hear people talk a lot of times about, I like strong coffee, I don't like strong coffee, but we need to define what we mean exactly by coffee strength, because there is actually a technical definition of coffee strength, and it's not the definition that we usually use. Okay? Coffee strength and coffee extraction are two different things, and we need to be very clear about the distinction between them. Coffee strength, as I said, has a specific definition. It is the ratio of the weight of the water to the weight of the coffee used when brewing. It is the ratio of the weight of the water to the weight of the coffee used when brewing. That is not the way we tend to use it, right? We tend to use it in terms of, well, this is strong coffee. We use it in terms of flavor, right? It tastes strong, okay? That's not how it's defined. It's really about the concentration of the brewing process. How much coffee are you using for the amount of water that you're using? That's really what we're talking about when we're talking about coffee strength. And the reason why it's important to distinguish between these two is because they control different things. Coffee strength determines the intensity of the flavors that you taste. Coffee strength does not determine which flavors you taste. It determines the intensity, how strongly you taste those flavors. Coffee extraction determines which flavors you taste. Okay? So coffee strength primarily determines the intensity of the flavors. Coffee extraction determines which flavors they are. Good ones, bad ones, that's all about extraction, not about strength. Strength is about intensity of flavors. So it is entirely possible to have weak coffee that tastes delicious. And it is entirely possible to have strong coffee that tastes awful. Because they're two different things. Coffee strength and coffee extraction are totally different things. And it's important to, uh, to be able to draw that distinction. Because strength is really easy to fix. If the coffee is too weak, Use more coffee. It's an easy solution to fix strength problems. Okay? All you have to do is change the ratio. Very easy to fix coffee strength. So how do you do that? How do you control coffee strength? Another take-home message. Buy an inexpensive gram scale and use it. Weigh out the water that you're using to brew. Weigh out the coffee beans that you're using to brew. And now you know what the coffee strength is. If you need to change it, then change the weights. If it needs to be stronger, add a higher coffee weight. If it needs to be weaker, use less coffee weight. 
Now, you may be thinking, this dude is out of his mind. I'm not weighing anything. I'm not doing that. That's crazy. I, I just use a scoop, right? I have a little plastic <laughs> scoop, and I scoop, and I put it, right? That's called a volumetric measurement when you, when you use a scoop like that. And there's actually a really big problem with doing volumetric measurements when brewing coffee. And that is coffee beans vary dramatically in their density depending on their roasting level. So light roasted coffee is much more dense than dark roasted coffee is. And so if you use a scoop, you're going to get radically different amounts of coffee depending on the roasting level. That's why mass is what you need to trust. You need to weigh it out. So to demonstrate uh, this density difference, that is 25 grams of light roasted coffee on the left and 25 grams of dark roasted coffee on the right. You can see the volume of 25 grams of dark roasted coffee is significantly larger than the volume of 25 grams of light roasted coffee because light roasted coffee has way more moisture left in it it has not been roasted as long or as hot. It has a lot more moisture in it. Those beans are a lot heavier, and, uh, and the density is much higher. Okay? So if you really want to control your coffee brewing, again, the whole premise of this talk right, is how do, we, how do we produce really great coffee? If you want to produce really great coffee, you have to weigh it out. You have to weigh the water. You have to weigh the, the, the coffee out okay, to be able to control those variables. Where do you start? What kind of ratio should you, should you use? 16 to 1 is a good place to start. 16 grams of water for every 1 gram of coffee. Okay, That's a great ratio to start with. For most people, that's a good coffee strength. You might like 17 to 1 or 15 to 1. You can always tweak it. Again, strength is very easy to manipulate. Okay, But 16 to 1 is a great place to start. So I said strength is really easy to adjust. You just change your ratio, and it is. Extraction is much, much harder. Extraction, remember, determines which flavors we're going to get. Strength determines how strong they are, how intense they are. Uh, extraction, though, is much more difficult to adjust. Okay, so we talked about the extraction process. Water goes into the pores in the coffee particles, right? Dissolves the soluble compounds, comes back out into the cup. The question is, when the water goes in, does it dissolve all the soluble compounds? in the pour or not? And the answer is no. The water does not uh, dissolve all of the soluble compounds in the pour because chemical compounds differ in their solubility. Okay, this is one of those chemical terms that we use. Okay, and basically we, what we mean by this is how easily they dissolve in the solvent. How easily they're going to be able to be transferred from the bean to the solvent, the water. Okay, some compounds dissolve very easily and very quickly, some compounds dissolve uh, much, it's much more difficult to get them to dissolve or they dissolve much more slowly. They differ in their solubility. So compounds that dissolve very quickly and easily, we're going to call those high solubility compounds. Okay, they have a high solubility, they dissolve very easily in the water, doesn't take any, as soon as the water's there, they've dissolved and they're going to come back out in the cup. Okay, compounds that barely dissolve at all or that take a much longer time to dissolve in the water, we're going to call those low solubility compounds. Okay, I know this is basic stuff for some folks. That's okay. Okay, we're trying to, trying to keep this approachable. So we've got high solubility compounds. We've got low solubility compounds. Um, so what are we dealing with in coffee? Do we have high solubility compounds or low solubility compounds? What do we have? A little bit of everything. Remember, there are hundreds of compounds in a cup of coffee. Some of them are high solubility. Some of them are low solubility. Some of them are somewhere in between. We have everything under the sun in uh, in our coffee beans. Okay, so we have a little bit of everything. We have about 70% of a coffee bean is made up of insoluble fiber, stuff that's never going to dissolve. That's why when you pour the water into the coffee grounds and you get done brewing, there's still coffee grounds because there's stuff that doesn't dissolve, right? If it all dissolved, then the, the thing would be empty. Okay, so there's about 70% of a coffee bean is just stuff that's never going to dissolve in the first place. It's fiber, it's not going to dissolve, it's never going to end up in your cup. About 10% of a coffee bean uh, by mass is, are lower solubility compounds. Okay? And these lower solubility compounds, in general, taste bad. These are not things that we want in our cup of coffee. Okay? 
And about 20%, the remaining 20% are higher solubility compounds. And in general, these are things that taste good. Usually these are things that taste good. There are some exceptions to that. But in general, these higher solubility compounds are the ones we want. We don't want the low solubility ones. We do want the high solubility ones in our cup of coffee. So the stuff that can be extracted, the stuff that has the possibility to dissolve in the water, remember the fiber is never going to dissolve anyway, right? We're never going to get that part. So the stuff that could dissolve in the water is a mixture of good and bad. There's some stuff in there that tastes good, and there's some stuff in there that tastes bad in this mixture of compounds that could dissolve in the water. That's that stuff, right? So we have lower, a mixture of these lower solubility compounds that taste bad and higher solubility compounds that taste good, Mostly, again, there are a couple of exceptions to that. There are some higher solubility ones that don't taste very good, like caffeine. Uh, so what are all these compounds? Well, most of the extractable compounds, so when I say extractable compounds, I mean compounds that could dissolve in water, things that could conceivably dissolve, that we could conceivably extract if we, if we worked hard enough. Most of the, co the extractable compounds in coffee fall into one of three categories. And again, these are broad categories. There's hundreds of compounds in coffee, so I'm not going to hit them all, right? This is three broad categories. But these three categories are generally acids, okay, which in general have a pretty high solubility. They extract quite quickly. They dissolve in the water very easily. They come right back out very easily. And primarily acids give you sour flavors, okay? So we've got some high solubility compounds that are going to dissolve very quickly, and they're going to make our coffee taste sour. Okay? And then we have carbohydrates or sugars that are in general more sort of moderate solubility. They're, they'll dissolve, yeah, that's fine, but they're not going to be super quick about it. Um, they extract more slowly and they're sugars. They're generally going to be sweet. So we're going to get sour ones that dissolve for sure. We're going to get sweet ones that might dissolve, right? They, they could. And then we have lipids, so fats or oils. Coffee's full of them. There's lots of them in there. Um, and this is kind of the exception. So fats, generally speaking, don't dissolve in water. Okay? If, you make, if you've ever made vinaigrette, right, you know that oil and, and vinegar, oil and water things don't mix. Right? You get little bubbles. Um, so the lipids don't actually dissolve. However, the process of the water going into the pores and coming back out of the pores has a tendency to push the lipids out. So they're not actually dissolving in the water, but they're kind of almost effectively doing the same thing because they're coming out anyway, right? They're coming out of the pores and into the cup. They don't contribute a whole lot of flavor, generally speaking. These fats don't we, don't, we don't taste them very much, but what they do contribute is what's technically referred to as body to a coffee, or sometimes in a, in a very strange word, referred to as mouth feel. How does the coffee feel in your mouth? Does it tend to coat the inside of your mouth? Does it feel kind of thin and watery? Does it feel thicker and heavier? That's the lipids that do that, that contribute to the mouth feel of coffee. Uh, most of the fats are removed by the filter paper. So if you're using a paper filter when you brew coffee, that's going to remove most of those fats. They're going to be absorbed by the paper and never make it into your cup anyway. Exception to that would be something like French press, which doesn't use a filter paper, and you get, tend to get a lot more oils in French press coffee. Okay, so what about caffeine? Everybody's favorite coffee component, right? Everybody loves caffeine. That's why a lot of people drink this stuff. So what about caffeine? Uh, so caffeine, as I sort of alluded to earlier, is a high solubility compound. When the water's hot, it dissolves like mad. It dissolves very, very easily, um, and it tastes bad. It's, it, caffeine does not taste good. It's pretty bitter. Uh, it's, but if you're going to drink caffeinated coffee, you're sort of stuck with it. You're going to get the caffeine. Fortunately, um, it doesn't tend to overpower some of the other flavors as long as you're making the coffee correctly. Okay, so caffeine, very soluble, extracts very quickly, and is somewhat bitter. There are some other important compounds, uh, and these are important in the sense that they taste really, really bad. Okay, uh, so... These are, and this is a little technical, forgive me if you're not a chemistry person, okay? Uh, so chlorogenic acid lactones, okay, this is one of the, the key culprits in bitter coffee, okay? If coffee tastes overly bitter, it probably has to do with these. Chlorogenic acids are good in coffee. The problem is that if you continue roasting, chlorogenic acids turn into chlorogenic acid lactones, which makes it bitter, okay? So one of the key culprits that causes coffee to be bitter 
is going to be those guys as well as uh, phenylindanes, also quite bitter, very, very bitter flavor. Um, fortunately, both of these are lower solubility compounds. The higher solubility stuff tends to taste good. The lower solubility stuff tends to taste not so good like those guys. Okay, so we want tasty coffee. We want coffee that gives us all the tasty stuff and none of the not tasty stuff, right? We want to leave the bitter stuff behind. We just want to extract the tasty stuff, the stuff that actually tastes good. And this is where chemical principles can help us. This is where understanding how, how extraction works and understanding the chemistry of what you're actually doing when you brew coffee can help you figure out how do I, how do I structure this thing? How do I manipulate this so that I just get the good stuff and I leave the bad stuff behind? at least to the extent that we're able. So we want the high and the moderate solubility compounds to be extracted. Remember, those are the acids, which you're going to get anyway. Those are the highest solubility things. You have no choice. Those are going to come out, okay? But we want those, and then we want the carbohydrates. We want the sweet stuff. We want the sour and the sweet, and we want to leave the bitter stuff behind. That's the lower solubility stuff. So we want the high and moderate solubility to come out, and we want to leave them the bitter stuff behind. So we can manipulate our brewing variables. We can adjust our brewing variables to make that happen so that we get the, the, the sour stuff and the sweet stuff to extract into our cup and we leave the bitter stuff behind. And sometimes we refer to this as being the level or the depth of extraction. Okay, so the le if you extract to a higher level, that means you're pulling out lower and lower solubility stuff. Okay, or a greater extraction depth, that means you're pulling out lower and lower solubility stuff. Okay? So what are these variables that we can manipulate to adjust the flavor mix that we get in our cup of coffee? Grind size, so the size of the actual coffee particles, is a major variable, super important okay, to this process. The contact time, how long is the water in contact with the coffee grounds? Major variable, super important to this process. Okay, and then the water temperature, less important, but not unimportant. Okay, so we're going to call that sort of a minor variable. So we have two major variables, grind size and contact time, and then a minor variable, which is water temperature. So grind, the most important variable, no question. The most important variable okay, in brewing is the grind size because particle size affects extraction. The water extracts at the surface of the particles. So the more surface there is, the more extraction there's going to be. And the smaller particles you have, the more surface you're going to have. So smaller particles means more extraction. Okay? So the size of the particles is really, really important in this brewing process. Small particles, as I said, have much more surface area than large particles. Finer grind will extract faster at the same water temperature than a larger grind. Now, if your grounds contain, when you grind your coffee uh, and you take the grounds, right, and you're going you're gonna to brew, you're going to put it in your coffee maker, um, if you were to look at those under a microscope, you would discover that there's a whole wide variety of sizes in there. You've got little tiny particles that you can barely even see. You've got big, huge particles. You've got a range of particle sizes, and that's a problem because every one of those different sizes is going to extract differently because size matters. Size affects extraction. And so every one of those different particle sizes is going to extract differently, which means the mixture of flavors you get from every one of those different particle sizes is going to be different. So ideally, we would love to have all the particles exactly the same size. We would love to have all the particles exactly the same size uh, with a small number of really fine particles mixed in, because you need that, it turns out. We're not going to talk about that. But, um, but without that, without a few of those little fines in there, the coffee is really not as good, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, ideally, you'd like to have most of the particles be all the same size. So you get exactly the same amount of extraction from every one of those particles. And so then to adjust the flavor, you just adjust the grind size. If you need to extract less, you make the particles bigger. If you need to extract more, you make the particles smaller. You just adjust the grind size to adjust the extraction. That assumes that your grinder is capable of doing this in a predictable way. This assumes that you have a way of adjusting your grinder to say, I want the particles to be bigger, or I want the particles to be smaller, and that when you do that, your grinder actually does that. Okay? 
And there are lots and lots of grinders out there that cannot do that. Lots of grinders cannot do that in a predictable way. So, in order to fine-tune your grind, in order to, to adjust the grind, in order to adjust flavor, you need two things. You need predictability, so that when you turn the knob this way, you know what's going to happen. And you need uh, consistency, okay? So you need predictability and repeatability or consistency, so that every time you grind that coffee on that setting, you get the same mix of grind sizes. And a blade grinder, if that's what you're using as a grinder, a blade grinder will never do this. A, a blade grinder has neither of these. It has neither repeatability, uh, nor predictability, nor much of anything else that's positive. Okay? A, a blade grinder, you're, you're just slightly better off than using a hammer. Okay? I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, in order to get optimum flavor, you want particle size consistency. Again, we, ideally, we'd love to have all the, all the particles be exactly the same size so we get the same extraction, and that's actually really hard to do because when you grind coffee beans, they tend to shatter. When you grind coffee beans, they tend to just sort of blow apart into lots of different sizes. And so there's a tremendous amount of engineering that goes into creating a coffee grinder that minimizes the range of the sizes that are produced when you grind coffee. Okay? Take home message. Told you there's a bunch of these. Take home message is a high quality burr grinder is vitally important if you're going, if you're going to try and make a good cup of coffee. You need grind consistency, and the way you achieve that is with a high quality burr grinder. Okay? I told you that I'm going to hand you a sheet of paper right, that has take home messages on it. Uh, one of the other things it has on it is a, is a buying guide. But you can take home with you at least my recommendations, for whatever that's worth, of what you should go out and buy if you want to make better coffee. Okay? And a high quality burr grinder is absolutely on the list. In fact, a, a burr grinder is the single most important thing you could buy to make better coffee. Nothing else even comes close in determining the quality of the coffee you make to the grind. The grind is very, very important. Contact time, that's the second variable, another major variable. In order to address contact time, we need to address the fact that we really have two different categories of brewing. We have filter brewing and we have immersion brewing. Okay, and they're a little different in terms of how they deal with contact time. So you would think contact time, I mean, that's how long the water stays in contact with the grounds, right? So that shouldn't be that hard. You just change the time. It's actually not that easy to, to, uh, to adjust or manipulate most of the time. So we need to distinguish, as I said, between filter and immersion, immersion brewing. Filter brewing is when you add the gra water gradually to the coffee grounds and you let it drip through, right? So this is uh, things like pour over, okay, or your regular old coffee maker, your Mr. Coffee, right? This is all filter brewing kind of stuff. The contact time when you're doing filter brewing largely depends on the rate at which the water drains through, right? You pour the water in and the water drains through and how long the water is in contact with the coffee depends on how fast it drains through. The problem is that that depends on how consistent the grind is because you're almost always using a filter paper and the thing about paper is that it tends to get clogged with little tiny particles. So if you have a, if you have a, a a bad grinder that's producing a lot of little tiny particles, it will clog the filter paper, make it take longer for the water to drain through, and now the filter, now you have very little control over the contact time. Okay? So grinds that are too fine tend to clog the filter, slows the whole process down. Not all filter method, methods are, have the same susceptibility to this. Flat bottomed brewers are generally easier to deal with, especially if you have a grinder that's not great. Okay? These are brewers where the bottom of the brewer inside the filter basket is flat as opposed to being a cone. Okay? If it's shaped like a cone, then it's going to be more susceptible to getting clogged when you have fine particles. If it's flat, it's much less susceptible to getting clogged, so a better fit if you don't have the best grinder out there. Immersion brewing, real quickly. Uh, immersion brewing refers to methods where we add the water in all at once, we wait a certain amount of time, and then we just remove all the coffee. Right? So we separate it all at the end. So things like uh, French press, aero press, a variety of other things also called press. Um, there's a bunch of them. There's an American press and an Espro press and, and several others. Uh, the contact time for immersion brewing depends on how long you leave it in there. 
I mean, it's, it's much more straightforward to control contact time with immersion brewing. Most immersion methods, though, struggle to remove the finest grounds. If you've ever had French press coffee, you probably found sludge in the bottom of the cup because it uses a mesh, a metal mesh filter, and that mesh is only so fine. And so, again, if you have a grinder that doesn't do a very good job, those really tiny particles end up in the bottom of your cup. That can be unpleasant when you get to the bottom of the cup because then it gets a little chewy. Um, <laughs> The other downside is that those particles are in your cup the whole time you're drinking it, which means they're sitting there continuing to extract the whole time you're drinking it, right? So being able to remove those little particles is a good thing. Unfortunately, most immersion methods don't excel at being able to remove those little particles. So we often end up with sludge and over extraction. In other words, particles that sit in there too long and we start extracting the bitter stuff. The stuff we don't want starts coming out because they're in there for too long. We needed to leave them in there for a much shorter period of time. They're in there too long. However, immersion brewing, and I'm not going to explain why this is true. It would take too long. Immersion brewing in general uh, is less susceptible to uh, over extraction due to contact time because the extraction process actually slows down as the brew happens. So the longer the coffee is in there, the slower the extraction happens. Okay? It's a self-limiting process for reasons that chemists probably understand immediately. I'm not going to explain. It would take too long to explain why that's true. Um, you just have to trust me that this is true. Okay? So uh, take-home message, it's not a bad thing to try uh, a long contact time with your French press, especially if you're using a really light roasted coffee. Let it sit in there for five or six minutes. See what happens. Sometimes it ends up being really delicious. Uh, and again, because it's sort of a self-limiting extraction process, it oftentimes doesn't turn out as bad as you might otherwise think. Water temperature, that's our third variable. Less critical but not unimportant. Uh, most compounds, generally speaking, chemically speaking, most compounds, solubility increases as temperature increases. So the hotter water you use, the more easily this stuff is going to dissolve in the water. Okay, that's the, that's the sort of the general rule. So hotter water means more extraction. Faster extraction as temperature goes up. Fortunately, this is a very easy, easy variable to control as long as you have the right equipment, as long as you actually can control the water temperature. Okay? And this is where uh, this is a problem for a lot of folks. The recommended optimal temperature for brewing coffee is between 195 degrees and 205 degrees. That's the optimum temperature. And virtually no coffee makers actually do that. If you measure the water temperature coming out of your coffee maker, unless you have bought a very nice coffee maker, it is very unlikely that you're getting anywhere close to 195 degrees. Okay? It is much hotter. The recommended brewing temperature is actually much hotter than most coffee makers are capable of achieving. There is a group called the Specialty Coffee Association that actually tests this for coffee makers. And then they publish a list of the coffee makers that actually are able to get this hot, that are actually able to achieve this standard. That list is available right there. Okay, So you can go to that, that website and you can look up the certified coffee makers by this, the Specialty Coffee Association. Um, I have also recommended several on my buying list, which... I will be handing out later. By the way, I have no financial interest in any of that, right? I make no money on any of it. So it's just, it's purely just to try to be helpful. Um, it's also important to remember that the, the temperature of the water is actually not that crucial. It's the temperature of the blue, uh, the blue, the temperature of the blue, I said it again. <laughs> the temperature of the brew slurry that matters. The temperature of the brew, uh, Brew slurry. So in other words, it's the temperature of the coffee and the water together that matters. That's where the extraction is happening, not in the water tank. So it really, it, the temperature of the water is not as relevant as how hot the water stays during the brewing process, which means you want the water to stay hot. So the water needs to start out hot enough, and then it needs to stay hot enough during the brewing process so you get the extraction that you want. So my recommendation is that you use a brewer that doesn't absorb very much heat. 
that's not going to suck a bunch of heat out of the water and cool the whole thing down as you're trying to brew your coffee. So things made of plastic, plastic doesn't absorb a whole lot of heat, or thin metal. Okay? Ceramics are a real problem. Ceramics tend to, ceramic brewers tend to be very thick and heavy, and they absorb a ton of heat. I use a ceramic brewer all the time, almost every day. So I'm not saying it can't be done, but if you're going to use a ceramic brewer, you need to preheat the ceramic extensively before you actually use it for brewing. Okay, I did the calculation for my ceramic brewer. In order to get it to brewing temperature for that, that, that piece of ceramic, it would take almost two liters of boiling water to get that ceramic up to brewing temperature so that when I pour the hot water into it to brew my coffee, it doesn't suck the heat out. Okay, ceramic absorbs a lot of heat, and so you have to, to uh, preheat it extensively. So, take home message. Another one, investing in a quality coffee brewer will pay off in terms of durability. A lot of these that are recommended by the Specialty Coffee Association, these are famous for lasting 30 or 40 years. They're very, very well-built coffee makers. It will pay off in terms of durability and in terms of flavor because it'll actually get the, the water hot enough to brew correctly um, and, and keep the, the slurry hot. If you're gonna do pour over, you still have to be able to control your water temperature. I recommend a gooseneck kettle. There's one back there. I've got all my coffee stuff back there on that back table if you want to take a look at it. Um, a gooseneck kettle that has digital temperature control. Okay, so I, when I make coffee in the morning, I, for this coffee, I brew it at 195. I punch in 195, and it heats up the water to 195, and I brew my coffee. Or if this coffee needs 205, I do that, and I brew my coffee. Okay, this has been a lot of words, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, it's been a lot of words. Um, and so one of the things that I, that I was trying to figure out with this talk is, how can I, how can I get away from words? Um, how can I give you some kind of a visual, some, some, something, some visual thing that you can engage with that will, that will maybe um, give you something to mentally picture when you're brewing coffee? And so I came up with this. I hope it's effective. Um, this, this visual right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to say the high solubility compounds are over here on the left and the low solubility compounds are over there on the right. Okay, so high solubility on the left, low solubility on the right. And so if we identify what compounds those are, we said the acids and the oils, right, they don't actually dissolve, but they act like they're high solubility. Uh, the acids and the oils, those are the high solubility things. The low solubility ones are the bitter ones, so those are going to be all there on the right. And then the carbohydrates are moderate solubility, so they're in between. Okay? Everybody following along so far? Okay. So, and so if we apply flavors now to this. Right? The acids and the oils, the oils don't taste like much, so they don't really have a flavor. Uh, but the acids taste sour, yeah, the carbohydrates taste sweet, and then the bitter stuff tastes shockingly bitter. Okay? <laughs> so we have sour, sweet, and bitter. This kind of gives us a way of, of, of visualizing this extraction process and how if we change one of our variables, how is that going to affect the flavor of the coffee that we end up with? So extraction in this visual always starts at the left hand side. The high solubility stuff, that's the stuff that's going to dissolve right away. You have no choice. That is going to end up in your cup of coffee. There's nothing you can do about it. That's the way it's going to be. Okay? So it's always going to start at the left, and it's going to work its way over to the right. As extraction progresses, it's going to work its way over to the right. So where the extraction finishes in our cup of coffee depends on our variables, depends on the grind size that we used and the contact time that we used and the water temperature that we used. Okay? So it's going to start at the left, and it's going to work its way over to the right. So, just to remind you, finer grind, smaller particles, that's going to move the extraction finish over to the right. That's going to be more extraction, it's going to move us to the right. Longer contact time, more extraction, that's going to move it to the right. Higher temperature, more extraction, that's going to move it to the right. Okay, so that's the, going to be a, the effect of those variables. All three of those variables, finer grind, if we, if we make the grind finer, if we increase contact time, and if we increase water temperature, all three of those are going to do the same thing. They're going to extract more, and the extraction finish is going to move to the right. Okay? All right. So let's do some, let's do some thought brews. <laughs> These are like thought experiments, right? These are like brewing coffee, but just thinking about it. I, I thought it was cool. 
Okay. So, so let's imagine, let's imagine that our, that our uh, extraction finish is right where that arrow is. Okay? That's where our extraction finish is. That means that those are the compounds that we extracted. Right? It always starts at the left, and it wor works its way to the right. So if we stop it, right, if, we, if we use a set of variables that causes the extraction finish to end up there, that means we've extracted acids, which are sour, and oils, which don't taste like much of anything, and we didn't get to the sweet stuff, which means our cup of coffee is going to be sour. Yeah? Because that's all that's in there. We just extracted the sour stuff, so it's going to be sour. That's the way this is going to work. And there's a term for that. We would call that under-extracted. When coffee tastes sour, it means it's been under-extracted. It hasn't been extracted enough. We haven't worked hard enough to pull the sweet stuff out. With The, the sour stuff's going to happen anyway. You have no choice about that, right? But we need to extract the sweet stuff to balance the sour stuff to give us a good cup of coffee. And if we stop, it, if we stop the extraction too soon, either because the grind wasn't fine enough, or the contact time wasn't long enough, or the temperature wasn't hot enough, right? All of those would do this. We're going to get under-extracted coffee that tastes sour. Let's imagine we stop it right there, at that arrow. Well, that means that we've extracted all that stuff, right? We've got all the acids, which you're going to get every time anyway. So we've got all the sour stuff, but we also got the sweet stuff. To balance the sour stuff, this is going to produce a really tasty cup of coffee because you're going to have all the sour stuff. By the way, most of the fruit flavors in coffee are acidic. They're acids. Most of the fruit flavors come from the acids, okay? So if you want fruit stuff, you got to get, uh, you got to get the, the acids, and then you want the carbohydrates to sweeten it out, okay? So we would call that correctly extracted. We've got the sour stuff, we've got the sweet stuff, and we didn't get the bitter stuff. The bitter stuff stayed behind, okay? So this would be a correctly extracted cup of coffee. Now, if we go too far and we end up where that arrow is, we're extracting all kinds of stuff. We've got all the sour stuff, we've got all the sweet stuff, but now we've got bitter stuff too. And that bitter stuff is really nasty. Okay, that bitter stuff tastes really bitter and really bad. Okay, and so we have a term for that as well. We would call that over-extracted. This is over-extracted coffee. When we've pushed it too far, we, the grind was too fine, or the contact time was too long, or the water was too hot. We pushed the extraction too far, and we went past the sweet stuff and out into the bitter stuff, and now that's compromising the flavor of our cup of coffee. Now, why don't we just do it perfectly every time? Right? Why don't we just say, well, if you use this grind size and this temperature at this amount of time with every coffee, you're going to get delicious coffee every time. If only. If only it was that easy. The problem is all the coffees are different. The flavor mix of those compounds differs between different coffees because they came from different places. They grew at different altitudes. They were processed different ways. They were roasted for different amounts of time. All of those things matter and they change the types of flavor compounds that are available and the quantity of each of those flavor compounds. The one we've looked at so far, I'm just going to call a medium roast coffee. Okay, we've got a nice balance of acidic sour stuff, carbohydrate carbohydrate sweet stuff, and yeah, there's some bitter stuff, but we're just going to try to avoid that stuff, right? By by tuning our variables to limit the extraction. But that, that mix changes if you change the roasting level. Lighter roasted coffees have a different mix of flavors. Darker roasted coffees have a different mix of flavors. So lighter roasted coffees tend to have much more acids in them. There's much more sour stuff in lighter roasted coffee. So if I want a correctly extracted, this, this is a quiz, you didn't know there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> if I want a correctly extracted cup of coffee from a lighter roasted coffee, do I need to extract more or less? More. I need to push it further to the right so that I get the carbohydrate sweet stuff included with the sour stuff, right? If I use the same variables, for a medium roast that I use for a light roast, I'm going to end up with a really sour cup of coffee because I'm only going to get the acids. And dark roast is exactly the opposite. 
Dark roast has tons of bitter flavors in it. So when you go to brew a cup of dark roasted coffee, you need to extract a lot less and leave a lot more behind in order to avoid the really intensely bitter stuff. Okay? So it's helpful to think about this mix of flavors and sort of where, that, where are they on this, this, this visual and understand that when we, uh, when we decrease the grind size, so we grind finer, or we increase contact time, or we increase temperature, it moves us to the right. We extract more when we do any of those things. Okay, there's a very helpful visual. This is also on the piece of paper. The piece of paper is packed with useful information. <laughs> uh, this is not mine. Okay, this was created by some really, really smart guys who know way more about coffee than I do. Um, they run a website called baristahustle.com. Um, <laughs> If you, if you want to seriously nerd out about coffee, that's the place to go. Okay? These, these guys are major coffee nerds. Um, I know you think I am, but no, these, are way, these guys are way beyond me. Uh, this is a really helpful visual. It's hard to read, I know. Okay? But in the center, it's actually really hard to read on this screen. Uh, in the center right here, so all of these words are descriptors of flavors. Okay, so there's things like strong and heavy and fruity and thin and insipid. You might have to look that one up. Um, right? there's, there's all these different descriptors. Okay? And so what you do is you taste your cup of coffee and you say, this one tastes insipid, for instance. And you find insipid on the, the compass. Okay? And insipid, by the way, is down here. Okay? So uh, you find insipid and... You say, well, I don't want to be here. I want to be in the center. This is where all the good stuff is. So I need to move up and to the right from where I am to get to the center. I need to move up and to the right. And you look over here, and that means I need to extract more. Okay? Because when we taste a cup of coffee, sour, sweet, and bitter sometimes doesn't cut it. Right? There's other descriptors that we might use. Sometimes when you brew a cup of coffee, it doesn't taste sour. It tastes grassy. Well, what do you do with grassy? Like, how do you use less grass? I, what, how, do you, how do you compensate for grassy, right? That's, that's, that's why this is so helpful, because believe it or not, grassy is on there, okay? It's called vegetal, uh, a vegetal flavor, I know. You might have to look that one up, too. Uh, so, so you would find vegetal, and you would say, okay, I, wanna, I don't want to be at vegetal. I want to go to the center, and so I need to go down and to the right, which means I need to extract more and use less coffee. Okay? Notice that strength is the vertical axis here. So more coffee is up here, less coffee is down here. Extraction is the horizontal axis. Extraction and strength are not the same thing. Right? So strength you adjust by adjusting your ratio. Extraction you adjust by grind size, contact time, and water temperature. Okay? So there's a copy of that on the sheet of paper. You're welcome. <laughs> Two other factors, and then, and then I, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to quit. OK. Uh, <laughs> Two other factors, that I, one of which I'm going to say is minor, and the other I think is actually pretty major. Uh, so the first minor factor is water quality. Water quality is not just about what's not in the water. Obviously, we don't want lead in our water. Right? We, don't, like we don't want bad things in our water. But in terms of how water affects coffee, it's not just about what's not in there. It's also about what is in there. Because the mineral content of water affects extraction. The more minerals there are in the water, the more effective that water is going to be at extracting the flavor compounds in coffee. Okay? And so the amount of minerals that you have in your water affects the coffee that you end up tasting. Okay? That's all the stuff I just said. Mineral content affects extraction. So ideally, ideally you would go to the store and you would buy distilled water, right? No mineral content. And then you would add the amount of minerals necessary to create the perfect brewing water. Believe it or not, this America's great. Believe it or not, there is a company that sells little packets of powder that you add to a gallon of distilled water in order to produce the perfect coffee brewing water. 
So you go buy a gallon of distilled water, you buy one of these packets, you rip it open, you toss it in there, shake it up, presto, perfect coffee brewing water. Okay? The company is called Third Wave Water. I'm a little ashamed to admit I actually do this. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm sorry. You can mock me later. It's fine. Uh, so Third Wave Water is a company, if you're interested, the little, the little packets are about a dollar a piece or something. They're not super expensive. Um, and it's, it's just so stinking convenient <laughs> to make good water that way. However, uh, the water quality in West Tennessee, we are very blessed to have actually really high quality water in West Tennessee in general. Um, and so we don't have to deal with a lot of water quality issues that people in other parts of the country might have to. That's a minor factor. So the water mineral content, it's a minor factor. If you really want to geek out, you can start obsessing about that kind of stuff. Okay, the bigger factor. And this is, this is something that I think um, if... So I mentioned at the beginning that I'm, this whole talk was going to be about producing a really good cup of coffee, right? But how do we get from a really good cup of coffee to the perfect cup of coffee? And I think that's where this factor comes in, in my opinion. And that is context matters. Context matters to how we experience flavors. This is the reason why the food that you eat on vacation always tastes better than the food that you eat at home. It's not necessarily that the food is actually any better. It's that when you eat it at home, you're not on vacation. Context matters. It affects the way we perceive flavors. It affects the way we perceive things that we consume and that we, the, the way things affect our senses. Context and experience matter. And this is why if you ask somebody the, what the best cup of coffee they've ever had is, they might just tell you that it was grandma's cup, cup of coffee. They might just tell you that grandma's coffee, which was Folgers or U-Ban or something, right, <laughs> made on a 30-year-old Mr. Coffee that had all kinds of grime and coffee scale, and, right? But somehow, that was the best cup of coffee they've ever had. Or maybe it was the cup of coffee that they had when they were a kid that grandpa gave them when they were sitting out in the shop hanging out with grandpa. That was the best cup of coffee they've ever had. In my opinion, that's the missing part of getting from a great cup of coffee to a perfect cup of coffee. The experience, the context of who are we with when we're drinking this cup of coffee? What experience are we having? When we're, are we drinking this cup of coffee on a terrazza in, in Italy? Are we drinking this cup of coffee sitting in my office? That affects things, right? That affects how we perceive, uh, and there's lots and lots of psychology research to prove that. It affects the way we perceive uh, flavors. So that is, in my opinion, the secret to the perfect cup of coffee. And I'm going to say one more thing. I spend a lot of time thinking about making coffee. I spend a lot of time trying to perfect how to make a great cup of coffee. I've just spent far too long trying to tell you <laughs> how to make a great cup of coffee. I, I really want to make great coffee. But... We ha I think we have to be careful, and I, this is something I have to remind myself of, and I, I want to express it to you as well, because I think we have to be careful that in the pursuit of something like a perfect cup of coffee, we don't lose sight of the things that are more important. If in our pursuit of a perfect cup of coffee, we become inhospitable, if we make a comment about a cup of coffee that someone gives us that maybe isn't great, then what have we gained? Right? Yeah, we may know a lot about making coffee, but if we're not being hospitable, both providing hospitality and accepting hospitality in a gracious way, then in my opinion, we've lost a lot more than we've gained in trying to pursue the perfect cup of coffee. So thanks for your attention tonight. Appreciate it.